All we like sheep have gone astray, we've turned every one to his own way, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. To Martha, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Before we turn to the scripture this morning, let's bow our heads together and go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, you have given us your word. It is a remarkable thing that we have in front of us, that we have this book that has been written over a period of 2,000 years and recorded and transmitted and preserved, and that we can have confidence in it and that we can trust it and that it is central to our spiritual lives, that we are to read it, we are to study it, we are to know it, we are to commit it to the depths of the memories of our souls, that we might use it in times of our lives, in every situation, every detail, that we may learn to think your thoughts after you. As the psalmist said, if I regard iniqui- as the psalmist said, thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. And as Jesus prayed, it is your word that is truth, and it is your word that sanctifies us. And so, Father, as we study this morning, may we be reminded of uh, of the many truths in your word that strengthen us and give us hope from day to day. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Open your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 22. We're continuing our study of this period of confrontation between Jesus and the religious leaders in in Israel. And I think it's extremely important for us, as we look at this, to understand the context, to understand that this isn't one of those passages that is going to uh, make us feel all warm and fuzzy. It's not one of these passages that's going to focus our attention upon the cross. It is a, a series of encounters with, with one of the uh, most insidious and evil groups of people ever to populate the planet. Now, most people don't want to think about the religious leaders of Israel in quite those stark terms, but that's what Jesus refers to them as. He calls them evil and wicked and uses a number of extremely harsh uh, adjectives to describe the depths of their depravity. Because whenever someone is teaching something, the end result of which will lead to the eternal destruction of those who follow them, What could be more evil than that? And that is what we find in the the basis of this confrontation. And as a result of this, we're seeing this, this building up of this intense opposition to Jesus through the series of uh, parables, uh, questions, parables, and these questions as we go through this, this particular section. The focus of this particular encounter in Matthew 22, 23 to 33, is, though, on resurrection. And whenever we talk about resurrection and the truth of resurrection, this is something that indeed does give us hope. Just by way of review, in, starting in Matthew 21, 28, which is the second day that Jesus is in Jerusalem, after his triumphal entry, he teaches three parables. These parables are interconnected and interrelated, and as he teaches those parables, he is announcing judgment on the religious leaders, which they understand very clearly. Each of these parables develops a subtle answer to the question they had asked, Jesus, by what authority do you do? Do you teach these things and perform these miracles? 
And so he is answering that. Each of these parables involves a father, uh, a son or sons, and the rejection of the father's authority. And then each parable is addressed to the unsaved and their judgment, these unsaved non-religious leaders, not the multitude. He is announcing judgment on them, and they understand this. Each one builds the case for God's rejection of the religious leaders of Israel, even as they are rejecting his son. And so he is going to announce judgment on them, and as we have read, they know that he's talking about them, but they fear the multitude. They know that he is condemning them, and they are reacting in anger and in resentment. Those three parables from Matthew 21, 28 to 22, 22 are then followed um, by these three questions from Matthew 22, 15 on. It, it, they ask, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? We looked at that the last two weeks. And they're trying to create a question that puts Jesus on the hot seat that if they frame it the right way, if he answers one way, he's in trouble. If he answers it the other way, he is also in trouble. So one of the lessons we should learn from that is that not every question that someone asks us when we're talking about spiritual things or the gospel is necessary to answer. Because sometimes we get caught in that trap. Somebody says, well, have you quit beating your wife yet? And if you answer yes, then you're admitting that you've been beating her. If you answer no, then you're saying you're still beat her. So the issue sometimes is to say, well, let's rephrase the question. Let's talk about what's really going on. But Jesus in his answers is, uh, he, he is remarkably sophisticated in how he answers where he creates a new structure for the question in his in his answers. Now, I talked about their reaction, and it's important for us to understand that what we see here in the intensification of their opposition to Jesus, we see a building up of this hostility. I mean, it is a uh, deep, profound hostility to Jesus and to the truth. And the more he answers and turns the tables on them, the more intense their opposition becomes. What we see in terms of this, I just want to review the verses that have pointed this out. It's at the end of Matthew 21, 45 and 46. Now when the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived, they knew, that's the, the word there. They knew that he was speaking about them. This isn't just some general thing he has said, but they know that, he, that, that the point is directed at them. And when they sought to lay hands on them, that implies that they have a plan and they have an agenda. They feared the multitudes because they took him for a prophet. Now, I want to think a minute about who these Pharisees and chief priests are. If you looked at them and you didn't know anything that was going on, you would think that they were fairly good people. They're very religious. They're very active in their religion. They're going to the temple on a regular basis. They are profoundly involved in the practice, the chief priests in the practice and carrying out of all the rituals in the temple. And the Pharisees are teaching the people and in that culture, the Pharisees were the most biblically centered, the most Torah centered, uh, the most uh, righteous looking, the most moral looking group in the, in the culture. They looked good. They had good arguments for their positions. And you would not think of them at all as being evil. We have similar kinds of people in our culture. We have people in our world today that, that seem to want good things. They seem to have good arguments sometimes for what they want, and they have political agendas. 
But we have to understand that then as now, the real agenda is not always evident to people. It is not out front. They cloak it in deception. They use good sounding words. And in our culture, uh, where we have all sorts of sophisticated communication skills, uh, the politicians are especially adept at saying things and knowing what people want to hear and saying it in a way that makes it sound acceptable and sound good. And you hear other people who are critical of some things, and you think, well, how could they be critical of doing whatever that policy is? Because it sounds so helpful and so compassionate and so, so loving. And so it calls for a level of discernment to understand what is going on. What we see in the scriptures is that God the Holy Spirit is exposing the internal motivation of the thinking of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the others involved. In 22.15, after Jesus gives his third parable, the Pharisees go together to conspire and to plot how they can entangle Jesus. And someone comes to them, and the basis of the Greek grammar is that they received a plot. They, didn't, they, they were already thinking about how they could kill Jesus. That had been going on for at least, uh, at least seven or eight months, depending on when the Matthew 12 episode is, uh, is placed in your chronology. But their desire is to kill Jesus. Now, how moral or a group of people whose ultimate desire is that they take their enemies and to have them murdered or, or executed. And if you listen carefully to the dialogue that's going on in our political culture today, you will discover that there are those, especially on the left, who continue to talk about infringing the freedoms of those on the right who disagree with them. There are these attempts to uh, stifle anyone who disagrees with them on any number of issues. There's attempts to float legislation. It doesn't get very far so at this time, but float legislation to somehow punish those who uh, disagree on issues from global warming and environmentalism to issues related to uh, sexual identity and gender identification, gender confusion, all of these different things. And basically what they want to do is to completely do away with the First Amendment because this kind of speech, in their view, is dangerous because it's dangerous to their, to their agenda. And ultimately, they, just, they, they want to get, get rid of any kind of opposition and shut it down, even to the point of imprisonment. I have read of some who've said that they want to imprison anyone who does not agree with their global warming agenda. And that's just one aspect. So, so I want to draw this, this kind of parallel because when we start seeing people react this way, then we need to think a little more deeply about what's really going on beneath the surface in terms of these, these policies and these philosophies. In Mark 3, 6, Mark states the same thing a little more uh, intensely. He says, then the Pharisees went out and immediately plotted with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. The question we should ask is, what is it that generates this kind of anger and resentment and hostility? Now, Jesus goes right to the heart of the issue. In Matthew 20, 18, 22, 18, we're told that Jesus perceived their wickedness, their evil. These moral religious leaders, these outstanding examples of Torah obedience, are identified by the Scripture as being evil. It is the mask that is worn by uh, uh, the mask of human good that is worn by those who are intensely antagonistic to the plan of God and the word of God. And so we see examples like in uh, uh, Romans 1, 18 and 19. In talking about, in a broad sweeping overview of history, 
the Apostle Paul is talking about how God's judgment in time works its way out, and he calls that the wrath of God. And he says, for the wrath of God is revealed, that present tense is showing its continuing action. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. See, this is the basic orientation of the human mind, the fallen carnal human mind is in opposition to truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. Jesus identifies the word of God when his high priestly prayer to the Lord, he says, sanctify them in truth, thy word is truth. So what people in their carnal fallen state have in the depths of their soul is an agenda to suppress the truth of God, to suppress the living word of God and to suppress the written word of God. They despise it. And what has happened in our culture over the last 15 or 20 years, as we have gone further and further down the road to moral relativism, and if we've gone further and further down the road of, of, of licentious living and accepting just about anybody's lifestyle, what we see is the people who have been in the shadows suppressing the truth are coming out of the shadows, and they are, uh, they are becoming more and more open, and they're networking, and they're coming to understand uh, that, that as they advance their agenda that they have a certain political power base that has really coalesced in the last seven or eight years uh, in Congress. And so they, and they've, had a, uh, they've had decisions that have been made in the courts by various uh, justices that have legitimized their positions. And as they become more and more legitimate, they become more and more outspoken in, in what their agenda is. Uh, take, for example, the, the, the LGBTQ movement. A lot of people may think, well, you know, they may have a point. There are, there, there are certain rights that you have homosexual couples and they've been living together a long time and they've been sharing their income and everything, that they should have certain, certain rights, that this makes sense, that if one of them becomes ill and is in the hospital, uh, they, their, their health needs and health issues should be communicated with their partner. This, this makes sense, or, or financial benefits. And so th th this is the starting point of, the, of this kind of argument. But if you think that that's all they want, that's only the first step. That that's legitimizes it, and they operate on this, this, this view of, of, of incrementalism. It's like boiling a frog in the pot. If you put a frog in a pot of hot water, it'll jump out, but if you put a frog in cold water in the pot and gradually increase the heat increment by increment, you'll boil the frog to death. And that's their agenda and their process and their methodology. Because mark my words, the goal of the LGBTQ community is, first of all, for th to be able to get out of the closet, and secondly, to stuff the Christians into the closet. They want to tear down the Bible because the Bible says that what they are doing is a sin. Now, we don't we understand that the Bible doesn't single out homosexuality as some super sin. It is one of numerous sins that are listed in a number of sin lists that we find in Scripture. Sin lists that include things such as gossip and slander, uh, things such as uh, more extreme like murder, but also divisiveness, uh, enmity. So it is another sin of many sins along with immorality, sexual immorality, adultery. These are just, uh, are classified in that same group of sins as homosexuality. So we don't take it and, and try to make it some super sin. It looks that way because that's the point at which the fortress is being attacked. And so when you, it's coming at that particular sin, then it looks like that's what we're focusing on. But that's only because that's where the attack is. If they were trying to legitimize slander or gossip or 
uh, defaming somebody's character, libel, something like that, then we would have to fight that as well. Because we understand that to legitimize sin of any kind is destructive to the whole society and the whole culture that there has to be an ultimate standard of what is right and what is wrong. But the point that I'm making this morning is that we have to understand that when truth is at stake, that it exposes the agenda of those who are truth suppressors, that what they want to do is annihilate the source of truth. And that's what's happening with these religious leaders. These are not the rebellious, licentious crowd. This is the good people. These are the moral people. These are the ones who look good. And their idea is to, is to destroy Jesus. They want to kill him. Now, Jesus hasn't done anything wrong. But he has exposed the hypocrisy of their teaching. And so they wish to kill him. Today we live in a world that has been dominated for too many decades by a, the encroaching philosophy that is sometimes called liberalism, but more accurately it's called progressivism. And progressivism is built on a presupposition that human beings are basically good. The reality is that the Bible teaches that people are basically evil. And they need to have authority and a government that restrains evil. That is why God initiated government, as we've studied, as one of the um, divine institutions, the fourth divine institution, to restrain, uh, to restrain evil and, in the case of criminality, uh, to punish evil. But within the worldview of progressivism, we have deeply held convictions about the nature of man because they, because they believe that man is basically good, they have to reject anything and everything that comes out of a biblical worldview which is grounded in a specific creation story in Genesis 1 that speaks about the origin of evil that corrupts the, the human race. And so they have to reject that. So they have to come up with an alternative theory of origins. And so they are committed to evolutionism. They are ultimately committed to globalism because uh, this was the attempt after the Noahic flood in order to bring uh, unification to the world against God, and it was manifest at the Tower of Babel. God intervened, and he divided up the languages so that men could not talk together. But there's always been this focus in the human heart manifested in empire building in the ancient world and in the Middle Ages, and now it's manifested through the doctrine of globalism. And through computer languages and through trade and through many of these things, we find ourselves more and more being spoken about as a global community. And those who hold to progressivism basically want to tear down borders, they, they, which is destructive to nations. But the scripture clearly says that God, uh, God has established the borders of the nations. That is, the, that is God's purpose for man is to maintain national distinctions and national identities. And so they are anti-nationalism. They are globalists. And you see this when you see people at the upper echelons of the business elite that are trading internationally, and that is what's good for their business, that they have more loyalty to globalism than they do to the country that made it possible for them to build and develop their, their business and their wealth. They're committed to the eradication of sexual or gender identity. After all, if there's no real creator and the, uh, the apparent sexual distinctions that we have physically are just the result of time plus chance, then why can't we as human beings figure out a way to make that fluid so that you can be whatever you want to be? And you can identify with whatever gender you want to identify, no matter what day of the week it might be. Also, it comes down to climate change. We want to control the climate. What man has, ha has done is to elevate himself to the position of God. 
Once you remove God from being the creator, then you've created a vacuum. Nature abhors a vacuum. And so something has to move into that vacuum. And so the intellectual elites have developed these theories where man basically can control everything and redesign creation according to his own likeness. And so at the very core of this is that opposition to truth. When you are denying truth, you, are, you have to create an alternative truth. You have to create an alternative explanation of everything in order to promote your agenda. And what this leads to is a, is a conflict that is manifest throughout our culture today. And many have spoken to the culture wars that are going on. And these culture wars are ultimately grounded in people who are committed to two radically opposing worldviews. That's what we see with Jesus in this opposition from the religious leaders. He is proclaiming that God is a God of grace and of God who will solve the sin problem through an alternative solution known as a sacrifice, and he will be the one who will be the fulfillment of that that symbolism that's been carried on through the Old Testament, he's the one that will go to the cross as the Lamb of God who will take away the sin of the world. And that people are saved by grace because they can do nothing to save themselves. But that doesn't bring and accumulate power to a religious elite. And through, even in Christianity, you have those who are committed to legalism because it builds power in their uh, frame of reference. Whatever their church or denomination might be, it builds power, it holds power, it holds a threat over people. And so there's always this conflict between grace and legalism. And this is what is happening here is that the chief priests and scribes who've come along and back in chapter 21, verse 15, and then following that you had the chief priests and the elders and the chief priests and the Pharisees, and then the disciples of the Pharisees and Herodians in the previous question. And now we have the Sadducees who come to confront Jesus. Again, it is still the same confrontation. It is the confrontation of human authority versus divine authority. And they have rejected divine authority in the way they have constructed their view of the world. The Sadducees were the religious liberals of their day who still held to a form of morality, but they have denied the truth of the scripture. They have also denied most of the scripture. The Pharisees, in contrast, were the religious conservatives of the day, but they too had also rejected the true meaning of Scripture and substituted their own meaning and interpretation on top of Scripture. So we've gone from the Pharisees to the Sadducees, and we're told in verse 23 that same day, so this is following the question about paying taxes to Caesar, the same day the Sadducees who say there is no resurrection, came to him and asked him. Now that's an important detail because most people wouldn't be familiar, most readers later on wouldn't be familiar with the somewhat esoteric philosophy and theology of the Sadducees. They did not believe in a uh, resurrection. And we're told this in Uh, passages such as Acts 23.8. This is a sophisticated situation where the Apostle Paul has been brought up on charges that he is causing uh, instability and and division in the Jewish community, and he's teaching that you shouldn't obey the law and all these other things. So he's brought before the Sanhedrin, which is composed of the uh, aristocrats, which were the Sadducees. Most of them were the uh, the wealthy, the aristocrats, the uh, the elite in the in the culture, versus the Pharisees, most of whom were in the the out of the working classes. The the Pharisees were were taught to have a trade. This is why Paul, who, consider, who says of himself that he's a Pharisee of the Pharisees, he's a tent maker. This was true of anyone who was a Pharisee. They were taught to have a trade and a skill uh, by which they could make, make a living. But the Sadducees uh, were, were very different, and they were the, the elite, the wealthy, the aristocracy, 
And they had an interesting belief system, and part of that was that they denied resurrection. They, they were materialists. They didn't believe in angels or spirits, and they didn't believe that, that there was life after death, whereas the Pharisees believed that. And in the context, if you remember, Paul says that he is on trial for the hope and the resurrection of the gospel. And as soon as he said that, they started bickering among themselves and entered into almost a a, a riot and a brawl uh, in the Sanhedrin, and he's forgotten and ignored. So so he, he used that against them. We know a few other things about the Sadducees. We don't know a lot because they really, Sadducee and theology did not survive after the destruction of the temple. It was Pharisaical theology that became encapsulated and sort of redefined, and and today we see it more in the theology of Orthodox Judaism. Flavius Josephus, who was a Jew, who was a Jewish general, who was captured by the Romans in the Jewish revolt and then went over to their side and was later sponsored by the, by the um, uh, house of Tiberius, I mean, excuse me, the, high, uh, the house of Flavius, the Flavian uh, emperors uh, provided for him, and he wrote various works that are the only other source of real knowledge we have of the first century. And he says of the Sadducees, but the Sadducees are those that compose the second order and take away fate entirely. God really isn't in control. They're almost like deists. He says they suppose God is not concerned in our doing or not doing what is evil. And they say that to act what is good or what is evil is a men's own choice. They almost destroy the whole concept of a distinction between good or evil. And they so, so they say to everyone that they may act as they please. They also take away the belief of the immortal duration of the soul and the punishment and rewards in Hades. It's really nice if there's no punishment or rewards, and it really doesn't matter whether you do good or evil today. That They're the moral relativists of that generation. In another place he says, but the doctrine of the Sadducees is this, that souls die with the bodies, nor do they regard the observation of anything besides what the law enjoins them. Now what that means is that they didn't accept anything beyond the Pentateuch, the Torah, the first five books of Moses. They have an abridged view of the Bible. And that's important to understand here because when they raise this question about resurrection, which they don't believe in, when Jesus answers them, he doesn't go to passages in the Psalms or in Daniel 12 too that would affirm resurrection because they don't accept those books of the Old Testament as authority. The point is that Jesus understands the people to whom he is teach, talking. When, when we're witnessing to somebody, we need to understand what they believe, and we need to make sure we are tailoring our comments and our answers to their world view. We don't compromise with their worldview, but we have to understand where they're coming from. We have to think we're not creating issues or not that are really non-issues in, in a uh, witnessing situation. So the Pharisees come along and they set up a hypothetical. Now in a lot of cases, a hypothetical, I don't like hypotheticals. Now some people come up with a hypothetical and they're basically talking about themselves or someone close to them and they're just they just don't want to come out and say it's something they're facing but a lot of people just for the sake of argument will develop hypothetical situations and most hypothetical situations only hypothetically happen I doubt this would happen but it, they're they're creating this this hypothetical situation as if it if, as if it were genuine And so they come along and they say, well, teacher, Moses said that if a man dies having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now, this sounds like a somewhat odd custom to us, but this was what was known as leveret marriage in the Old Testament. It's encapsulated in the Mosaic law in Deuteronomy 25, 5 through 7, excuse me, 5 through 10. But it, is, it was also a custom that preceded the Mosaic Law. This was an issue with one of, of, of Jacob's sons. In Deuteronomy 25, I'll just read through the passage, it says, If brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, 
The widow of the dead man shall not be married to a stranger outside the family. Her husband's brother shall go into her, take her as a wife, and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. The point is to preserve the inheritance, the property that is owned by the family, so that it stays within the family, and the inheritance goes on to the next generation. And so the law goes on to say that the firstborn son that she bears will succeed to the name of the dead brother. He is brought up as the son of the brother who died so that he inherits his property and the name of the brother who died is passed on. It is not lost uh, to prosperity. Uh, there's, a, there's a provision there that if the brother doesn't want to take up this responsibility, then uh, the brother's wife goes to the gate of the elders. That's where they, that, that was the city council and explains the situation and that the brother will not perform that duty. Then the elders of the city call him. They're going to explain the situation to him. Make sure he understands how vital this is. This is part of divine institution number three, the family, as it's preserved within the Mosaic law. And if he still does not want to take her, then um, she comes in the presence of the elders, takes a sandal off her foot, spits in his face, and says, So shall it be to the man who will not build up his brother's house. He has violated the sanctity of the family. And, she, and this is background to understanding what happens in Ruth. There's two examples in Scripture. Uh, Judah's son Onan refuses to take to be a lever. That is a second husband, brother, when his brother dies, uh, to take his wife Tamar. Uh, that's in Genesis 38, 6 through 10. And then this is the backdrop for understanding the book of Ruth. When Ruth's husband dies and she's a widow, then when she goes back with Naomi to Bethlehem, uh, Boaz is a distant kinsman, and she goes to him. And later on in the story, in chapter 3, he says, well, there's one who's closer, and he goes to him, and we have this whole episode where he says no, and then eventually Boaz takes the responsibility and marries Ruth, and Ruth is the great-grandmother of King David, so that's an important part of, of, of that line. But the Sadducees are going to build this really extreme scenario, and they say, okay, we had these, uh, this, this man and his wife, he dies, uh, he's got seven, uh, there, there are seven brothers, so there's six more brothers. The first dies after he was married and has no offspring left, um, and, and he, <clears throat> so he left his wife to his brother. Likewise, the second, the third, even the seventh. So she goes through the chain. She, she, the first son dies, and she marries the second son. No children. He dies. He goes to the third one. Uh, he dies no children. He goes, she goes to the fourth one. She dies. He dies. No children. Goes to the fifth one and on and on. And so, so they come to the end. They're going to ask the question. And most people look at this and go, well, I don't know why they're not taking this to the DA for a little investigation. <laughs> Sounds to me like we have a black widow on our hands. But they ask the question, which is facetious for them, therefore in the resurrection whose wife of the seven will she be, for they all had her. And th so they're setting up this, this scenario that, that wouldn't really exist, and they don't even believe it themselves because they don't believe in the resurrection. And Jesus, in his, in his tactful manner, I say that facetiously, Jesus did not go to the Dale Carnegie School of how to win friends and influence people. He tells it straight. He answered them and said, you're mistaken, number one, because you don't know the scriptures. Now, they're like all the other religious leaders, the Pharisees and chief priests and scribes. They all believe that they know the scriptures better than anyone else. And he, so he just slaps them in the face and says, you don't know the scriptures. You're ignorant of the scriptures. That is not a tactful way to handle it but it is from divine viewpoint at times. Notice Jesus isn't in your face like this with the tax collectors and the prostitutes. Jesus only gets this way when he's dealing with those who are dead set against him and in opposition to him and who have thrown down the gauntlet. They have already exposed their hostile stubbornness. He says, first of all, you don't know the scriptures, and secondly, you don't understand the power of God. They don't have an adequate view of God's omnipotence. 
they're like many Christians today and nearly everybody outside of the Christian sphere who don't have an adequate understanding of God the Creator. If God could take from the dust, from the dirt, from the chemicals of the soil, and mix it together and create a human body with all of the complexities that we have come to learn in the last 100, 150 years related to the human body. If God has the power to do this, and then to breathe into the nostrils the breath of life so that this comes alive and is a living, thinking human being with an immaterial soul and a spirit capable of thought, capable of inventiveness, capable of, uh, of volition, capable of learning and growing and developing all kinds of things. If God can do that, then why can't God bring that dead person back to life again and give them a new body? When you start with a small God that you have restricted by your intellectual arrogance, then uh, it's very easy to construct a theory against him. So he says, first of all, he's going to address the issue related to the power of God. In verse 30, he says, for in the resurrection, now this phrase, in the resurrection, that they've both used is a term that relates to the fact that in the future there's a judgment. Daniel 12 doesn't go, 12, 2 doesn't go into the uh, uh, distinctions of timing and other events that happen uh, in the end times. It just says there will be a resurrection of the good and the bad. And so in uh, uh, the conservative theology of the Pharisees, then the Jews understood that there was a future time when all would be resurrected for, from the grave and then they would be judged. And some would go to life and some would go to condemnation. And that is what he means, what is meant by the resurrection. Now, it's interesting here in this confrontation to be reminded that the Pharisees had a completely different understanding. The Pharisees believed in resurrection, but this question that the Sadducees are asking Jesus is a, is a question that they would often throw at the Pharisees. There's, it was a, all, always a debate between the Pharisees and Sadducees and intense arguments, as I pointed out from Acts, um, the intense arguments between the Pharisees and Sadducees over this. And the Sadducees had constructed this kind of a question as a trick question to, to win the debate with the Pharisees. And the Pharisees didn't have an answer for it. But Jesus has an answer for it. So he says, first of all, we have to understand that in the resurrection, those who are resurrected in a resurrection body are not, uh, will not marry and will not be given in marriage but they are like angels of God in heaven. Now, what he means by that, because the question always comes up when people who love each other, they've been married 40, 50, 60 years, and they say, does that mean that when I'm in heaven, I won't be with my spouse? Well, I want you to notice that the text doesn't say that they neither love nor are loved. It's talking about the divine institution of marriage. And the divine institution of marriage was created for a specific purpose. And that purpose, part of that purpose, involved protection of uh, sexual activity to keep it within the marriage so that in procreation the children would be within the, the marriage where there's a father and a mother and where those children would be reared in the context of the biblical concept of family. So, and the biblical concept of family is the training institution for the next generation. And so in the resurrection, there is not a need for those divine institutions. And just as there will be no volition in heaven, because once we are in heaven, there's no longer going to be an opportunity to sin. We'll be sinless. We can't choose not to sin anymore. That's just in this life. So divine institution one is out. Divine institution two is out. Divine institution three is out. These are not part of what the society in heaven will be like. It'll be a total transformation. Um, 
So we are given it. Uh, they won't be. They won't marry or are given in marriage. Also, we should note that this phrase "to marry and given in marriage" is pa- was part of the language related to the initial coming together of a man and a wife in marriage, and their sexual union, which begins that particular marriage. So it indicates that that sexuality, in this sense, the physical sexuality, is not going to be part of our resurrection bodies. That need for procreation is not part of what it will be like in heaven. They're like angels of God in heaven. Now, some people raise the issue here and say, well, what about that incident back in Genesis chapter 6 where the sons of God, if you take that term to mean angels, and I do, that sons of God took the daughters of men as their, as their wives and they had children. Well, if angels don't have sexuality, then how did they do that? Well, angels are created with an immaterial body. An immaterial body isn't going to procreate. So angels, and we know that they did from different examples in the Old Testament, the angels that accompanied the Lord to visit with Abraham. Abraham fixed a feast for them. We're told that they rested, they ate. They walked. They did all of these. They had all these functions. They didn't look like angels. Abraham thought they were people. They're described as men. So angels apparently had the ability to transform their spiritual immaterial bodies into physical bodies like a human being that had all the properties, including apparently sexual ability of a human being, but they weren't related to Adam. So that what's going on in that episode in Genesis chapter 6, and I've got other studies related to that as it's described in, in the book of Jude and also in, in uh, 2 Peter 2, it's very clear that these were uh, angels who rebelled against God and were seeking to destroy the genetic purity of the human race. And so this isn't about mar- marriage or sexual. This verse really doesn't apply to that. So Jesus says, first of all, you forget that in heaven things will be different than they are now. Second, he says, concerning the resurrection of the dead, now he's challenging their understanding of Scripture. Remember, he said, you're ignorant of Scripture, number one, and you ignore the power of God. God is able to, uh, to transform our physical mortal bodies into our resurrection bodies that will be very different. And now he talks about the the scripture. He says, but concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God saying, and here he is going to quote from uh, Exodus chapter 3 verse 6, where God is speaking to Moses and says, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And then Jesus makes the point, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. By the time of Moses, by the time God says this, around 1450 B.C., Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob have been dead for at least three or four hundred years. But God is saying that he is still their God. He is the God of the living. Uh, Exodus 3.6 gives us that original quote. God is the God of the living. It indicates that he is still a living God. And when you get into the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 11, describing the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we recognize that they understood that there was a promise that God had given them that ultimately would be fulfilled, and they never saw that promise. God promised to give them the land uh, of Canaan. But they never saw that. They never possessed that in their lifetimes. The only piece of real estate they owned was the cave of Machpelah down in Hebron. That was it, and that's where they were buried. So Jesus gives this sophisticated answer, and we see the response. There are three responses. First of all, there's the response of the multitudes, which Matthew mentions. And when the multitudes heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. Now, they're astonished at his teaching because he's given an interpretation of this passage that no one has ever heard before. They've never thought of that before, that that means that God is still, that they are still alive. They are in, they are not resurrected yet, but they are still alive. And we know from other passages that they are, are, were in paradise at the time. And there's a reaction from the Sadducees. Luke 20, verse 40 says, After that, they dared not question him any anymore. 
They've been using this as a gotcha with the Pharisees for decades. And now they've been got back. And they're, they don't dare question Jesus anymore. And third reaction probably was from the Pharisees, that the Pharisees were probably sitting in the corner going, yeah, that's the answer. <laughs> Jesus got him. Oh, yeah, we hate Jesus, yeah. <laughs> now, behind this, we see the affirmation of resurrection, that resurrection is a reality, and it is our hope. This is what Paul says in Acts 23, 6, when he's brought before the, the Sanhedrin, and he addresses them. He's very smart, and he says, ah, Part of them are Sadducees and part are Pharisees. And he cried out in the council, that word is Sanhedrin, says, men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, concerning the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am being judged. And he, he just threw that out there in the middle of the, of the council, and they just started pouncing on it and fighting each other. But he connects two important ideas, hope and resurrection. That no matter what's going on in this world, we can have hope because we know this world is temporary. That we are in a war today because we are in the midst of the angelic conflict as the overall cosmic conflict. But we are in a war that, that, that is not going well in our culture wars that are attacking us. We want, as 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 says, we want to pray for our political leaders that we may live in peace and tranquility and carry out our God-given mandates. But there's a war going on, and the only way we can survive that war is to fight with the spiritual weapons of warfare that we have. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 and following, as well as 2 Corinthians, that we are involved in this spiritual warfare, and our role is to learn the Word of God so that we can tear down these fortresses of human viewpoint ideas. And at the root of this, the motivation is that we have a destiny, and part, uh, so much flows from this. Second Peter, I mean, 1 Peter 1, 3, Peter says, that his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the Jesus Christ from the dead. And then as we're studying on Thursday nights in First Peter, we see that that is the foundation for understanding how to handle all of, the, all of the challenges and tests and fiery trials we face in this life. Next time we'll come back, expand the doctrinal significance of what Jesus is teaching on resurrection here to understand why that's important in terms of our day-to-day -day Christian life and Christian walk. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word. Father, we want to be reminded that there is resurrection for those who believe in Jesus Christ. He said that he is the resurrection and the life, and he who believes in him will never die. The key question for each of us is the same question he asked Martha in that interchange, do you believe this? The question is not what have we done, the question is not what sins have we committed, the question is not what responsibilities have, have we failed at, the question is what do we believe about Jesus? Do we believe that he is the Son of God who died on the cross for our sins? If so, then the promise of Scripture is that we have eternal life, and that eternal life can never be taken from us. And so we pray that if there's anyone here today or anyone listening today, that if they have trusted in that, that they have never trusted in Jesus Christ as Savior, that they would do so today, that they would believe that Jesus has died on the cross for their sins. That's all that's required of us. We can't be good enough. We can't go through enough ritual. We can't buy our way into heaven. We can only trust in Jesus, who is the one who opened the door. He, as he says, he is the door. He is the only way. He is the truth, and he is the life. And Jesus is the one who freely offers that salvation to each of us. Now, Father, we pray that you challenge us with what we study today, that we may live in light of the hope of the resurrection, that despite whatever battles are raging around us, that we will have our focus on the light and the truth of Scripture. And we pray this in Christ's name.